So you've got Genesis chapter 38, hopefully open, and we're going to go through this incredible chapter today as we continue our journey. And the title of today's sermon is God Can Change Anyone. God Can Change Anyone. Last Sunday, we started the life of Joseph, one of the greatest stories in the Bible. And we saw in chapter 37 how Joseph was betrayed by his brothers and sold into slavery. So his dad, Jacob, one of the patriarchs of Israel, is left grieving his son's presumed death while the ten older brothers lie, saying he was killed by an animal. And these guys are angry and they're bitter and they're brutal young men. Yet... God has a plan for this family, and God is going to raise up Joseph in Egypt. It's going to take about 20 years or so, not something he wants to happen, but God has a, a better plan than, Jake, than Joseph ever dreamed or, or imagined. And God is going to raise up Joseph, and he's going to be essentially the savior of the world from a great famine. We're going to get to that in a couple chapters' time. And his family, the sons of Israel, they are a special family, not because they were spiritual, not because they were so godly or they were uh, so amazing. Actually, they are more sinful, it seems, than even the surrounding nations. (laughs) Maybe they're the most sinful people, and yet God wants to love them and to bless them. He wants to keep his promises to Abraham, and he wants to show his power and his grace, yes, grace in the Old Testament, by transforming them to become his light in the world. And so God is so patient, and he's faithfully going to keep working in these sons of Jacob. Just like God is gracious with us, and God doesn't cast us away when we mess up. He's so patient and so gracious. And God can transform any life when we submit ourselves to him. And that's what we're going to learn here today. In fact, we're going to look at one of the brothers We don't know exactly what happened to all 10 brothers for the 20 years while we're going to study Joseph uh, serving in Egypt and being raised up. What happened back in Canaan? What happened with the other brothers? Well, chapter 38 gives us a little glimpse into what was going on back in Canaan. And chapter 38, uh, if you have not read it before, uh, you may want to uh, brace yourself. <laughs> it is a very strange chapter. And sometimes you come through the Bible like this, and there are chapters where you just go, What am I reading? What is happening here? How is this even possible? How is this in the Bible? Because it's one of the weirdest stories the story of Joseph's brother Judah and Tamar. But it is placed here in the Bible by the Holy Spirit for a reason. And we're going to see that just as God is working in the, let's call him the white sheep of the family, Joseph, God's working in him. God's going to humble him and raise him up to be a leader. God is also working in the blackest of sheep, in Judah, his brother. And we know from this chapter that God loves to work in anyone who submits their life to him. Let's start reading at verse 1. It says, it came to pass at that time that Judah departed from his brothers and visited a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira, and Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he married her and went into her. And she conceived and bore a son, and he called his name Ur. She conceived again and bore a son and called his name Onan. And she conceived yet again and bore a son and called his name Shelah. I guess that was a boy's name back then. He was at Chezeb when she bore him. So Judah is the fourth oldest son of Jacob. And you remember Judah was actually the one who suggested that they sell Joseph to the slave traders in the last chapter. So at this time in his life, Judah is not godly. He's not a great man. But there's always hope for everyone that God can change us if we submit to him. Now verse 1 says, Judah departed from his brothers. So there was a season where he was distant from the family, where he left the fold, the family of Israel, of Jacob. And by the choices he makes in this chapter, I think we can safely say that Judah was disillusioned with spiritual things. 
disillusioned with the spiritual purpose that God had given his family through Abraham, Isaac, and uh, his father, Jacob. Verse 2 says Judah saw a Canaanite lady. Canaanite means she was a non-believer in God. She was one of the pagan tribes around them. And he gets married to her. Now, the sons of Israel were not meant to marry the Canaanites because of their spiritual condition. And we've seen that the Canaanite tribes were completely into idol worship. Israel was meant to be a light to them, but instead the Canaanites are influencing God's people, like Judah, to dilute his faith and come down to their pagan lifestyle. So his decision to marry this Canaanite shows that Judah was not seeking to honor God in his life at this time. And then Judah has three sons uh, with this Canaanite. Now, all this happened while Joseph's in slavery in Egypt. And this is going to be a messy story. Look at verse 6. Then Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. So now we're skipping ahead about 20 years because Judah's oldest is now ready to marry. And as was common, Judah arranged a marriage for his son. And like Judah's wife, Tamar is also a Canaanite. So he arranges uh, for Tamar to become the wife of his son. By the way, Tamar is going to be the key character here, not the son. And her name, Tamar, literally means palm tree, which I think, if we can put ourselves back in that culture, that that is a very pretty name. <laughs> Tamar, palm tree. I don't think I've ever likened a lady to a palm tree before. Maybe if we lived 3,900 years ago in the Middle East, we would use that metaphor. Uh, to me, it sounds like she had big 80s hair with lots and lots of hairspray. Verse 7, it says that Ur... Judah's firstborn was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord killed him. Okay then, that's a pretty direct verse. And the Bible tells us that Ur was so wicked that God intervened, and God struck him dead. Verse 7, he was wicked in the sight of the Lord. The word wicked literally means evil or extremely harmful to others. Now it doesn't tell us what he did. I, I kind of wish it did. I would like to know. We don't know what he was doing, but whatever it was, in God's eyes, it was wicked, and so God took him out. Now, we may have in our mind a wrong idea about God, that God is vengeful, that God is mean, that he judges harshly all the time, and that is simply not true. He is a God of justice, but in our study in Genesis this last year, we've seen over and over that God is gracious that he is constantly kind towards sinners. God's judgment is always a last resort. Ezekiel 33:11 says God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but he desires for them to turn from their evil ways and to live and to trust him. So when judgment is necessary, it's, a, it's God's last resort. And God will judge, but only after warnings and warnings and opportunities to repent and after much more patience with sinners than we would have if someone was sinning against us in the same way. So we can conclude that whatever Ur did, he was warned, he knew about his sin, and he refused to repent, and he refused to change his ways. My guess is that God is actually protecting other people from this man Ur. And that's why he takes him out. Perhaps God knew this man would endanger the formation of the Jewish nation, which was happening at that time. We see that repeated throughout the Old Testament. I think of Haman, and God took him out. He was trying to kill all the Jews. And I'm, I don't know what Ur was doing, but I imagine it was similar, that he was going to corrupt the line of Judah beyond saving by the Canaanite practices that he was a part of. So whatever the circumstances were, he didn't repent, so God struck him dead. Look at the rest here. Um, 
Let's go on to verse 8. It says, And Judah said to Onan, his second son, Go into your brother's wife and marry her and raise up an heir to your brother. You say, okay, what's going on here in verse 8? Let me explain. The point is of the story is going to move to Tamar, the, the widowed wife. And she has no children. And in that culture, a childless widow would be the ultimate disadvantaged person in the culture. There was no social insurance, there was no welfare, there was no pension programs in those days. So when a woman would get older, if she was a widow, well, the only ones who could provide for her needs were her children. So to be a a childless widow in those days was a great tragedy. So what did they do to solve that problem in that culture? Well, there was a cultural custom that is long gone in our day that was called the Leveret marriage, and the word comes from brother-in-law. And later on, this is actually going to be part of the law in Deuteronomy 25. And the custom basically said, if a husband dies before giving children to his wife, then the next oldest brother was to marry her on behalf of the dead brother so that she could then raise a son in her deceased husband's name And so that son can keep the family line going, it was very important in those days, and that he can grow up and provide for his mother in her old age. And in the ancient Jewish history, this custom actually worked well to preserve the 12 tribes and as a nation, but it also worked to preserve and care for the widows. Now, we don't do anything like that today. We're under the new covenant and we're not so interested in keeping our family name going, and, and we have other means to provide and to save and, and to invest and things like that. So, um, you know, this is just getting to understand the context. Verse 8 is really interesting. Look at what goes on in verse 9. It says, But Onan knew that the heir would not be his, it would be his brother's. And it came to pass when he went into his brother's wife that he emitted on the ground lest he should give an heir to his brother and the thing which he did displeased the Lord, therefore he killed him also. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, remain a widow in your father's house till my son Shelah is grown, for he said lest he also die like his brothers. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. (laughs) Okay, good stuff. Here we go. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. We do go verse by verse through the whole Bible. We've got a lot of things to dig through here. And we believe it's here for a reason. So Onan, his responsibility is to give her a son. But all he was interested in was the act of sex itself. And for some selfish reason, he refused to go all the way with the arrangement and raise up an heir for his brother. What Onan did in that culture was a disgrace to his deceased older brother and a disgrace to the widow Tamar. And it also endangers the line of Judah. Now, verse 10 says, the thing which he did displeased the Lord. Not just the action itself. This, wasn't, this isn't God saying, don't use uh, family planning methods. That's not what, this, <laughs> what, what displeased the Lord. What happened here was that he refused to fulfill his responsibility toward his brother and Tamar. In other words, he pursued sex only as a means of pleasure. He had no heart to care for his family and for their needs and to raise up an heir. And in that culture, this was a great act of selfishness. It was ignoring his responsibility. And clearly, again, this man does not repent of his sin. He's unwilling to give her a son. So it says the Lord took him out as well. So to be clear, the sin that angered God was that he refused to raise up an heir and he condemned Tamar to a destitute life. So the application for us up to verse 11 is do not put pleasure above responsibility or selfish gratification over caring for your family. That's what we can take from that and and apply in, in our day. So verse 12 Goes on, now in the process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died, and Judah was comforted and went up to his sheep shearers at Timnah, he and his friend Hira the Adulamite. And it was told Hamar, saying, look, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his 
sheep. So she took off her widow's garments, covered herself with a veil, and wrapped herself and sat in an open place, which was on the way to Timnah. For she saw that Shelah was full grown, and she was not given to him as a wife. Okay, this is actually crazy here. Tamar, she still has no children, and Judah is now hesitant to give the third son to her. He's thinking, you married my first son, and he died. Then I gave you my second son, and he died. What's wrong with you? I don't really want to give my third son to you. And so Judah says, oh yeah, when he's old enough, you can go into him. But he has no intention, and he holds back the third son. So now Judah is sinning in this way, and he's neglecting Tamar. And Tamar is not getting any younger. Think about it. You're a destitute, uh, childless widow in that day. And there's a solution, and it's not being granted to you. You'd feel like you need justice. And she is certainly worried that she will grow up to become a childless widow for the rest of her life. And so Tamar hears through the grapevine that Judah is coming to town. It says in the time of the sheep shearers. And what's going on in the cultural context there is it was kind of like harvest time in in our Saskatchewan world. Uh, They would have a lot of sheep. And when it was time to uh, shear the sheep in the Canaanite cities, they would have a little celebration And they would offer sacrifices to the Canaanite pagan idols in order to get more. um, It was kind of superstition for next year's harvest of, of wool. And so what they would do in that culture was they would hire prostitutes. And it was part of their worship of their idols was this kind of illicit sexual rejoicing. (laughs) I I wonder who made up that religion. I got to be honest, like... Obviously, they had an agenda in mind when they created those rules of their Canaanite religion. So she decides to use this to her advantage. She takes matters into her own hands to fulfill her need, and she disguises herself as one of the Canaanite prostitutes. Look at verse 15. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a harlot, that's prostitute, because she had covered her face. Then he turned to her by the way and said, let me come into you, for he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. So she said, what will you give me that you may come into me? And he said, I will send a young goat from the flock. Now a goat would be quite valuable. He was going to pay a high price, but he didn't have the goat with him. He wasn't prepared. So look at verse 17. So she said, will you give me a pledge until you send the goat? And he said, what pledge shall I give you? What promise? So she said, your signet and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. And then he gave them to her and he went into her and she conceived by him. Okay, here we go. Just another normal day here in the Old Testament. We've got another dramatic layer. Tamar deceives and seduces Judah so she can have a son. Judah walks by, is tempted, thinking this is one of the local prostitutes. And he has a quick act to satisfy his flesh. And Judah, he unwittingly has sex with his daughter-in-law and causes her to become pregnant. This is a super weird story. And let's be clear, God is not condoning or promoting any of this by putting it in the Bible. The Bible is telling it like it is. And I appreciate the honesty of the Bible, especially about the flaws of even the heroes in the Bible. And actually, Judah is going to become a hero by the time we finish Genesis. But man, he was a flawed, sinful individual, just like me, and just like all of us. Now, I don't know what your ideal concept of a family is. I'm pretty sure the family of Israel is a lot more messed up than our ideal hopes of a family. I'm going to guess and just generalize that most people in our culture think of family, at least when we're younger, in ideal kind of terms. Oh, I'm going to fall in love. Oh, we're going to get married. We're going to have kids. We're going to get a dog. We're going to have a house with a nice white picket fence. And then one day we'll have lots of grandkids and we'll retire at a young age, relatively, 
and then we will never worry about money again and we'll live happily ever after. That's probably somewhat like the ideal image maybe we've had at one point of a family. But when you look at the family that God chose to work through in the Old Testament, (laughs) Israel's original name was Jacob, meaning he was a manipulator. He ends up with four wives, which wasn't God's plan, and it wasn't even his plan, as we studied. The ten oldest sons murder a whole town of, of people called the Shechemites. Then they sell their little brother into slavery in Egypt. Then Judah, the fourth son, marries a Canaanite. Two of his sons are struck dead by God because they were wicked. And then he has sex with a prostitute who is actually his daughter-in-law, and she conceives. I think we can safely say this is not the ideal image of a family here. But this is the family that God chose, that God called, that God decided he would work in them and he would transform them and use them for his glory in the Old Testament days. And through them, through this family, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, will come into the world to save everyone who trusts in him from all their sin. Isn't God gracious? Even in the Old Testament, you say, why would God use people like this? He's got this against him. He's got this against him, this against him. Surely God should just cancel this family and start again. Well, the message is, no matter how messy our lives are, God loves you, and God loves me, and he can work in and through anyone who submits to him. God loves the down and the outs. God loves us all equally. There are are no good people in the world. Do you know that? I know compared relatively to each other, there's good people and bad people. But we're comparing with the wrong thing when we say there's good people. If we compare with God, with his standard, with his Ten Commandments, with his holiness, if we compare ourselves with Jesus, we're all sinners. None of us are good. None of us earn or deserve God's love. It's impossible. Our best works, Isaiah said, are like filthy rags to the Lord. But he loves us. He loves us not because of our works. He loves us because of who he is, because he is gracious, because he is kind, because he made us and he loves us. And even though we're broken, he says, let me do everything I can to rescue you. And and no sin is too far for the Lord to stoop down and to save, and to bless, and to help, and to encourage, and to redeem our lives. That's the truth. What can wash away our sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And that's why God sent his one and only son into the world, to save us from our sin. And God's love is not based on our performance. It's based entirely upon him, his character, his attribute, his love, that is beyond our wildest imagination, And we were made to know his love. The deepest need of every single person in this world is to be restored to God and to know his love. To be forgiven, not because we earned it, but because it's a gift. And to receive that gift in Christ Jesus. That's what everyone's looking for. That's what the world is striving for. That's what everyone's hunting for. And we have the answer right here in Scripture because God is gracious and because of his love. Let's go on to verse 19. So she arose and went away and laid aside her veil and put on the garments of her widowhood. And Judah sent the young goat by the hand of his friend, the Adulamite, to receive his pledge from the woman's hand, but he didn't find her. And then he asked the men of the place, saying, where is the harlot who was openly by the roadside? And they said, there is no harlot in this place. So he returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. Also, the men of the place said there was no harlot in this place. And Judah said, I let her take them for herself, lest we be shamed. And I sent this young goat, and you have not found her. Judah is starting to feel guilty for his sin. And so he decides to let this go, hoping his sin will just disappear into the background. But Tamar is smart. Remember, she's trying to provide for her future here. She's not uh, just looking for pleasure in this world. She's trying to raise up an heir for her, her deceased husband. 
And so she puts on her widow's clothes, she bides her time, and she holds on to his signet ring, his cord, and his staff. Judah had given up three possessions that could only belong to him, and they would probably feature the family crest or initials or something personal on them. It would be like giving your driver's license and your credit card. Like, when she reveals these, there's only one person they can belong to. And she holds on to them as insurance because she won't be able to hide her pregnancy for very long. Verse 24, it says, It came to pass about three months after that Judah was told, saying, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has played the harlot. Furthermore, she is with child by harlotry. And Judah said, Bring her out and let her be burned. (laughs) Wow. What a hypocrite. Do you know what a hypocrite is? Someone who tells others what to do and then does the exact opposite with no intention of obeying their own standard. Judah knows that she has had illicit sex, and his first words are to condemn her for that sin, even though he was the one who did it. And he doesn't yet realize that it was him and her. Somehow she disguised herself well enough that he still doesn't know. And you know, when we walk in pride, this is a message to me and to all of us, our own sin looks really, really, really bad on other people when they do it. And it's very quick and easy for us to be critical of others when we see our own sin being displayed in their life. And that's wrong. Because it's so much easier to criticize others than to repent of our own sin. And God is using Judah to reveal, or using Tamar to reveal Judah's heart. And Judah, at this moment, what he should do when he hears Tamar, you know, has played the harlot, he should be like, oh man, so have I. I need to repent. That's what he should say. (laughs) Instead, he says, she needs capital punishment. Like, wow. His heart is so hard against God, and that's what can happen. Pride, looking down our nose on others when we ourselves need to repent. Jesus said, when you look at the speck in your brother's eye, sometimes we don't consider the plank that's in our own eye. And Jesus said, if you do that, hypocrite. He said, first remove the plank that's in your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the little speck that's in your brother's eye. We all have the capacity to be hypocrites, so be careful. And when we see the sins of others, we need to stop, and rather than criticizing, look in the mirror at our own hearts first and repent even of the thought of such a sin that would be inside of us. And repent of anything that we've been doing that is wrong before we try to help anyone else. This is the true heart that Jesus taught us to have. Verse 25, so when she was brought out, she sent to her father-in-law saying, by the man to whom these belong, I am with child. And she said, please determine whose these are. The signet, which has Judah's name on it, (laughs) and his cord, uh, which was very unique, and his staff, probably having his initials on it, I mean, she's got him. She is now exposing his sin completely. Verse 26, so Judah acknowledged them. And he said, she has been more righteous than I because I did not give to her Shayla, my son. And he never knew her again. So verse 26 is the turning point, the redemption point in this story because Judah is humbled by God through Tamar. He finally admits his own guilt his own lifestyle, his own living for himself and his flesh, and he never did it again. Now, the Bible tells us in James 4, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. And that's what Judah does here. When he realizes he's sinned, he says, God, she's more righteous than me. I'm never going to do this again. And I believe this is the turning point in his heart. And when we see him later on, we'll realize Judah has fully repented of even worse sins in his life than this chapter. And he's ready to become a hero uh, by laying down his life to save his family when we get to, I think, chapter 44. So amazing. Judah does humble himself. Are you humbling yourself? 
Am I humbling myself? And the warning in, th- in the scriptures is if we don't humble ourselves, then God will humble us. And actually, that's what really happened to Judah, wasn't it? He could have humbled himself sooner, and now he's been publicly humbled. And when that happens to us, all the more we need to humble ourselves and admit that we've been so self-centered and resisting God and defending our sin, but rather let's humble ourselves, let's repent, and let's get right with God. That's the message. And anyone can change, even Judah can change if we humble ourselves before God. Let's finish the last four verses and then we'll bring some concluding thoughts. Verse 27, Now it came to pass at that time of giving birth that, behold, twins were in the womb. Okay, let's add another element to this story. She's having twins. <laughs> Verse 28, So it was when she was given birth that one put out his hand and the midwife took a scarlet thread and bound it on his hand saying, This one's first. But then it happened as he drew back his hand that the brother came out unexpectedly and she said, how did you break through? This breach be upon you. Therefore his name was Perez, which means breach or breakthrough. Afterward his brother came out who had the scarlet thread on his hand and his name was called Zerah. So there's two kids born and again the younger is actually the one who's going to be the, the one who carries on the line and it inherits the... Uh, all the inheritance, the leadership of this family, which happens so often in in the line uh, from Abraham all the way through. The younger comes out first in this case. Amazing. Now, what's the main point that's being made here? None of the characters in this story are an example of godliness. And God is gracious to Judah and he's gracious to Tamar. And God does a work in them. And we will see that Judah so radically changes that, like I said, chapter 44, he becomes a hero. And by God's grace, the man who was once such a hypocrite and this lady, Tamar, who's a Canaanite, they will both be included and mentioned by name in the New Testament in the genealogy of the Messiah of Jesus Christ. That's actually remarkable. Matthew chapter 1 tells us they are all mentioned by name. It says Judah and Tamar, and then it talks about Perez, all in the line of Jesus. (laughs) Amazing. You see, next week we'll look at Joseph, and Joseph is going to handle temptation quite differently than Judah. Joseph's going to win. He's going to flee the temptation. He's going to be a total godly example. And you would think, and I would think, if God's going to pick one of the 12 sons of Israel to become the chosen line for the Messiah, surely it's going to be Joseph, because he's really the white sheep here. He's the good one. But God chooses Judah. (laughs) And God uses Tamar, and God uses this son Perez in the line of the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Why does God do that? The only answer is, is that God loves sinners. God wants to identify with sinners. Christ came into a line of sinners to save sinners. And that's God's heart. His grace, much more than we deserve, is God's gift to us. Judah and Tamar do not deserve any honor or any purpose in God's eternal redemptive plan, yet they're included. Amazing. And we do not deserve any part of God's grace and family and God's work and to be part of God's plan and purpose. I don't deserve it. But God opens the door to all of us and says, come on in. And he does this by sending his son Jesus into this line of sinners. Jesus never sinned, but he came and identified with us as we are sinners. And Jesus died for our sin on the cross He was the perfect one. If we could have just met Jesus for five minutes, and we can actually, it's called Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You can go home and you can spend hours with Jesus and you can see him. He was pure. He was spotless. He never sinned. 
He walked among us. He suffered the same weaknesses we do, but he never was selfish. He was never manipulative. He was never a hypocrite. He's the one man in all of history who never, ever showed one ounce of hypocrisy and sin. And yet, he died for you, and he died for me. That's the message of the Bible. He literally came. He walked in our shoes. He put on our skin. He became the God-man, and he died to save you and me from our sin. Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? That's the message today. If you've got your Bible bookmark, you can go there to Romans. Romans chapter 10. Maybe you're listening to this whole story of Judah and Tamar today, and you're thinking, well, I thought my family was bad. <laughs> Uh, maybe we're not quite as bad as these guys. Or maybe you're sitting here thinking, yeah, I do have a pretty messed up family. Well, the truth is your family is biblical, right? <laughs> I mean, not good biblical, but biblical. Because <laughs> all the families here that God worked in were very messed up. And yet God shows us that he can work in our lives no matter what. And even people like Judah and Tamar can be changed and forgiven and brought into God's family and God's eternal plan. And the message is that we can receive God's grace simply by trusting in Jesus Christ, by saying, it's not about me. It's not about my good works, trying to prove myself to God because there'll never be enough. But I receive the gift of God's love for me and God's forgiveness through Jesus, through his death his burial, and his resurrection. Romans chapter 10 tells us how this works. Look at verse 9 and 10. It says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And with the heart, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. It's saying all you need to do is trust in what Jesus has done and confess that he is your Lord and Savior. Believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Savior, that he is your personal Lord and Savior. Receive his gift. And the Bible says the moment we do that, we're born again to a whole new life. All that is old passes away. All our sin is taken off on us on the cross, is buried in that grave. And we're raised to new life. We're, we're seen by God as pure and spotless because Jesus' perfect righteousness then gets put to us. It's a switch. And God treated Jesus on the cross like he lived Tamar's sin and Judah's sin and my sin and your sin. God treated Jesus, the Father treated Jesus like he lived our life on the cross. And now today, if we put our faith in Jesus, the Father treats you and me as though we lived Jesus' life. Today, the Father treats you and me as though we have lived Jesus' life. God treats us as though we've never sinned if we put our trust in Christ because our sin goes on the cross and his righteousness, his perfectness is put on our account. And the Bible says we're a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. It says that Jesus became sin for us so we could be the righteousness of God in him. Today, this afternoon, we're going to witness three people getting baptized. And the baptism, it doesn't save them. It, the going in the water is just a picture See, what's happened is I've talked to all three of the people getting baptized, and earlier on in their life, they received Christ as their Savior. And they were born again, they were saved. They trusted in Jesus. And all their sin is wiped away, and they're, they're absolutely saved already today before the baptism. But the baptism is a picture, because what happens is the old life gets buried in the water, and the sin is buried. That's the picture of what's already happened and we're raised again to new life, washed and cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And we have the opportunity today to celebrate as these three people take what they believed 
when they were younger and make it their own faith and say, I've decided to follow Jesus for the rest of my life. Let me ask you today, where are you at? Have you made the decision to receive Christ as your Savior? He died on the cross for you. And if you have, are you taking a personal stand? Are you declaring to everybody, I'm a Christian. I'm going to live for God. Where are you at in that part of your journey? God is patient and God is gracious. And God wants to help you take the next step. I don't know what step you need to take right now, but you know. I believe you know what God is calling you to do next. Whether it's a sin that needs to be confessed, you can be free, you can be changed completely if, as you surrender that, any sin, any sin to God, even today. Judah gets completely changed, and, and any of us can be changed if we surrender to God. Is that the next step? Is it to take a public stand and to declare, I am going to follow Jesus? If that's the next step, then I encourage you, God will help you take that step. Is the next step to make a big decision that you know God is calling you to? You know what the next step is. And if you don't, I pray that before you leave today, you'll have faith that God is starting to open that up to you and speak to you as we worship in a moment. If you are ready and you've never received Christ, and you're ready today to do that, here's what we're going to do. Because the Bible says in Romans, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And I'm so glad that I prayed this, because I'm such a sinner, you guys. If it wasn't for God's mercy and gift, I know I would be either dead or in prison or living in the lowest place But God is so gracious and kind. And I'm so glad he helped me to pray this when I was younger. To say, God, I know that I'm a sinner. Would you please forgive me and I receive Christ as my Savior today? In a moment, we're going to pray that. And I'm going to ask everyone to close their eyes and to pray. And if that is you, I'm going to ask you to wave at me, to make eye contact so that you can confess before me publicly And I know it's COVID season, we've got masks on, we're not going to call people up to the front, I think that would be awkward. But I think today is time to make a stand, to say I'm going to publicly confess Christ. And then I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and I'm going to ask you to say it out loud. And it's just like I said just now, God, please forgive me of my sin, and Jesus, come and live in my heart and be my Lord and Savior. And if you're ready to pray that prayer in two minutes, or maybe one, one minute we're going to do that. Let's all close our eyes. Let's bow our heads. <clears throat> what we read today is here for a reason, and it's to show us that anyone can be changed by God, and God loves even sinners like us. If you're ready to receive Jesus today, I'd like to lead you in that prayer right now. And so if that's you, please look up and make eye contact with me and give me a a clear wave so I can know that that's your decision today. And I can lead you in this prayer. Amen. God bless you. Amen. God bless you too. Anyone else? Amen. God bless you too. Amen. I see you as well. God bless you. Amen. I see you as well. Anyone else? Okay. God bless you too. Yes. Amen.
Okay, you six guys and gals who raised your hand, we're going to pray right now. I'm going to lead you in this prayer, and you can say these words out loud to the Lord if, if I really believe we're called to confess in public. And if we can't do it, I'll just let that come to an end. Yeah, if we can't confess in public in a church, how are we ever going to stand for Christ in the world, right? So say these words out loud and mean them from your heart and God is listening and he's going to receive you right now and wash away all your sins. Father in heaven, you guys can say those words out loud. Father in heaven, thank you for bringing me here today. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sins. I receive your gift. Please forgive me. Please come and live in my heart. Please come and be my Lord and my Savior. Please help me to live for you. And I thank you for the death and the resurrection of Jesus for me. I receive your gift. Thank you for washing away my sins. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together.